few things as we get towards the preaching of the Word of God today. If you're new to this place or you've never been in an atmosphere like this before, I just want to encourage you. I want to let you know everything you've seen or heard today, you can find a direct command in Scripture to do. We are commanded to lift our hands. We're commanded to shout unto God with a voice of triumph. We're commanded to begin to lift up praise and worship to Him. We're commanded to dance before the Lord. And if that makes you a little bit uncomfortable for that, I well, I say sorry, but not sorry, I guess. Uh, because heaven, which we spent three songs singing about, is going to be a very loud place of praise and worship. All schedule, all time constraints, all physical constraints are going to be done away with. And I will be able to dance before the Lord with all of my heart, with all of my strength, with all of my mind. I'll be able to shout I'm famous for my voice going out. And maybe if we're lucky by the end of today, we'll hear my voice go out. But in heaven, I'll be able to lift up my voice with that heavenly throng for all of eternity and just begin to praise him and worship him. Together, we'll begin to extol him and say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was, who is, and who is to come. And so I, I like to get a little practice in down here. I'm just preparing for up there. It's what we're going to do for all of eternity. I'm not going to be just sitting around and going to the marriage supper of the lamb, though I'm looking forward to the marriage supper of the lamb. I love lamb. It's delicious. I know that's not the lamb we're talking about. Amen. Man. Okay, well. No more jokes. No more jokes. We're going to go to 1 Chronicles chapter 28 and verse 8. I want to pause and have a moment of prayer in this place today. Uh, many of you have already heard the news that we received this Friday. And um, for those that have not heard, Sister Kaylee DeFino uh, on Friday had an episode where there was just like a, an inability to communicate, almost like a blankness that came over her. And Sister Lindsay was there with her at the time. And um, it, was, it was concerning enough that uh, there was an ER trip involved and they did a, an emergency CT scan in the ER. And basically they told her, like, you need to go to Sioux Falls and get an MRI scan as soon as possible. And so Friday night, they went down to Sioux Falls, got an MRI of her head, and they found that there is a mass in her skull. And very soon, they're going to be uh, operating slash biopsying that, that mass. And so currently, she is down in, in Sioux Falls, and she needs the prayers of the church around her at this point. So that's what we're going to do here for a moment is we're going to get to the preaching of the word. We're, we're not in a hurry. I'm, I'm not going to be long-winded or anything today. But first and foremost, could we stand across this place? I do give honor to the Stewie family for their faithful ministry to that family. Uh, and after returning to Watertown and then getting the new sister Stewie got back in her car, went back to Brookings, and stayed with the kids so that mom and dad could go to Sioux Falls. And Lindsay was able to be with the kids and to, to let them feel love and let them feel the protection and the peace of God with them. But I believe right now in that hospital room in Sioux Falls, the power of God can step into that place. The power of God can step into that room. So can we lift our hands in this place? And let's just begin to call out on the name of Jesus as we lift up our sister and as we lift up the DeFino family in this house. Lord, I believe in your ability. I believe in your willingness. You are a healer. That's what your word declares, and we stand on that word. Uh, we don't rely solely on the hands of physicians. We don't rely, God, uh, or resign ourselves to the whims of fate. No, uh, everything is in your hands, Lord. Uh, and so this situation, it is not too big uh, for you, God. I believe right now that your power will enter that hospital room. Uh, right now, your mercy and your love can fill that home. Uh, 
Let peace fill her heart and Nick's heart and every child's heart, Lord. In the name of Jesus, I believe, God, that you're working it all together for good. I proclaim healing. I proclaim salvation over a family. In Jesus' precious name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, since you're standing, let's go ahead and read 1 Chronicles chapter 28 and verse 8. Now, therefore, in the sight of all Israel, the congregation of the Lord, and in the audience of our God, keep and seek for all the commandments of the Lord your God, that ye may possess this good land and leave it for an inheritance for your children after you forever. This is a good land we live in. I, I don't know if everybody believes that or not, but I do. This is a good land. And if we will seek for all the commandments of the Lord our God, he's promised us we can possess this good land. And not just possess it, but I can leave it for an inheritance for my children after me. And David goes on in verse 9 and says, And thou, Solomon, my son, know thou the God of thy father, and serve him with a perfect heart and with a willing mind. For the Lord searcheth all hearts and understandeth all the imaginations of the thoughts. If thou seek him, he will be found of thee. But if thou forsake him, he will cast thee off forever. Take heed now, for the Lord hath chosen thee, Everybody point to yourself and say, he's chosen me. To build an house for the sanctuary. Be strong and do it. With your attention for the next few moments, I want to preach on this thought. Building on my father's foundation. Building on my father's foundation. Would you set your Bible, would you set your phone aside right now, and one more time, just lift your hands to the Lord and begin to ask him to have his way in your heart. Lord, I thank you for your goodness. I thank you for the presence of God we feel already in this house. I pray, God, that every heart, every mind would be open, ready to receive. Let the seed of God's word plant itself down inside of the good soil of every heart. Let there go forth a challenge in the spirit, uh, a challenge, God, to every man, woman, and child under the sound of my voice, uh, not just to hear the word, but to do it. Uh, I worship you. I praise you in Jesus' name. Let's clap our hands to the Lord uh, one more time as you're seated. Today, of course, is Father's Day, and uh, Mom, if you missed that, I'm sorry. I didn't get you an earlier reminder, but you can just pretend like the present was there all along. But it is Father's Day, and I've not come to tear into fathers today because there is plenty of that in our world. Instead, I've come to encourage and then to challenge the fathers in this place, the future fathers in this place. Fatherhood in our country and in our times is so often disregarded. It is so often discounted. It is thrown to the side so casually and so easily. Popular culture does not have a very high view of a father. I won't beat you to death with statistics today, but far, far too many children are growing up without their father in the home, and the results are startling and significant. Children without the father in the home stand at a far greater risk of mental health issues, of incarceration, of illicit drug use, of a continued cycle of fatherless homes. But I'm looking at a collection of men today that are bucking societal trends. It is interesting to me how fatherhood is simultaneously the most exhausting and most rewarding thing in my life. It takes work. It takes effort. It takes energy. It takes exhaustion. It takes a sacrificial attitude and spirit. Why? Because to be a father, you have to stay. You have to pour out. And often there's not much pouring back in. 
There are moments in my life that make me keenly aware of my own frailty and weakness in an ever so clear way. Marriage was one of those moments. Now, I know it was 15 years ago when my wife Stacy and I got married, April 27th of 2007. One of the greatest days in my life, and I'm thankful for a godly wife. But standing there at an altar as it all began to sink in, I realized I was not just responsible for me. In fact, I was 18 years old. I'm not even sure I was responsible for me. But God is merciful. I was. I was responsible for me, I think. Ministry is one of those moments. And recently being elected as a senior pastor of a church, it's it's one of those moments where your own frailty and weakness settles and you you get a picture of yourself. Now, don't get me wrong, I, I, I feel a confidence, I feel an anointing from the Lord, but at the same time, There's human frailty and weakness, but nothing, nothing shows me my frailty like fatherhood. You see, I'm still in the stage of life where my kids think that I have all the answers and I can fix everything. Somewhere along the line, it happened for each of us, and probably at a slightly different area or a slightly different place. Some earlier, some later, and some still haven't reached that place. But somewhere along the line, we come to the painful realization, Dad isn't perfect, and Dad can't do everything. I'm thankful to be able to stand here today in the hearing of my father and say thank you You see, my dad went to work for his family, provided for his home when there were far more joyful things he would have rather been doing. In fact, as I prepared last night, there was a memory that came to mind of a a period of time. It was not his choice, but it was needed. He worked 40 straight shifts of 12-hour days from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m., 40 straight days without a day off, and got up in time to take his family to church every Sunday. Every Sunday got up and took his family to Sunday school. I'm thankful for a heritage that I can build on. He demonstrated a love for the kingdom. He demonstrated a desire to work for the kingdom, but somewhere along the line, the realization sank in. He's not perfect. Even worse, sorry, Dad. I love you. Even worse than realizing that your mother or your father is human is that there are far too many in this room today who have been hurt or even abused by an earthly father. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4 gives fathers very clear instructions. Fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. It is a very clear directive for those that are dads or those that are going to be dads. Your children should not be resistant and angry to you. Now, there are moments and times where you are going to have to set a hard no and draw a hard line. Uh, But just willy-nilly creating wrath in your children uh, is a contrary thought to the word of God. You are called to nurture, to care, uh, to admonish them in the Lord to tenderly raise them up. Father's Day for many is not a day of celebration. It's a day of painful memories or even worse perhaps of no memories. But I want to encourage somebody today. You have access to a heavenly father. He's never going to leave you and he's never going to forsake you. He's never been absent 
He's always been there. And not only is he not absent, but you've always got access. He's not too busy with work. He's not too busy on his phone. He's not distracted. And he's not going to provoke you to wrath. At any moment in time, you can run to him and lift up your hands and say, Daddy, I love you. You see, that's... That's my heavenly father, uh, and my heavenly father, he's rich, uh, and he's willing to pour out blessings upon me. Uh, he's willing to give me good gifts. Uh, he's willing to fill me with his spirit so that I'll never be alone. Uh, that's my heavenly father. My kids might someday utter the phrase, well, my dad can beat up your dad. Uh, but when we're talking about my heavenly father, uh, that statement will never cease to be true. Uh, that statement will always be fact uh, because there is no enemy uh, that can take out my dad. Uh, there's no enemy that can take down uh, my heavenly father. It's going to be a sad day when my three beautiful children realize there aren't very many people their daddy can beat up. But it's my goal as a father by that time, for them to be well acquainted with their heavenly father. Now Solomon, we read in our opening text, Solomon could say that. The text we read is King David is transitioning off the throne. He is elderly. He is about to pass off of the scene. And there's a little bit of a kerfluffle going on in the kingdom. There's a, 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 a fight about who's going to be king. But David brings Solomon, his son, and sets him on the throne. Now Solomon could say, my dad could beat up your dad. I mean, David killed Goliath. David has slain his ten thousands. He was a bad dude. But surely by this point, Solomon had also reached the realization that his father wasn't perfect. We've read it already in Scripture, but Solomon has surely been informed. The whispers throughout the kingdom have reached his ears. He understands the background of his life, and he understands dad wasn't perfect. Perfect. Can I just rescue somebody here in this place today and tell you, you are never called uh, to be this perfect pillar that never makes a mistake uh, or fails or falters. Uh, but David taught his boy the greatest lesson ever, uh, that when I fall, uh, all I've got to do is fix my eyes back up towards heaven uh, and realize I'm not perfect, uh, but he is. Uh, and when I call out on him, uh, I've got access to perfection. I've got access to his goodness and to his mercy. Dan, you're not perfect. I'm not just talking to my dad, I'm talking to all dads. You're not perfect. Free yourself from the expectation of thinking your dad was going to be the perfect dad. They're human. And hear me right now, fatherhood is one of the most rewarding and most challenging things you can ever do in your life. But David, David wasn't perfect, but David was repentant. And David got up on his feet and God restored and redeemed. Solomon was a direct product of David's greatest mistake and failure. David murders Uriah. He commits adultery with Bathsheba. He tries to cover it up, and God is not pleased. Go figure. And so that first child born of that union is killed, and that child passes away. The Lord will not be entreated by David's tears and by his fasting. But Solomon is the next child. And the Bible says immediately that Solomon uh, had the love of God resting upon him. And we read in Chronicles chapter 28 and verse 11, David gave to Solomon his son 
the pattern of the porch and of the houses thereof and the treasuries thereof and of the upper chambers thereof and of the inner parlors and of the place of the mercy seat and the pattern of all that he had by the spirit of the courts of the house of the Lord and the chambers and the treasuries and the treasuries of dedicated things. Uh, we see a father passing to the next generation uh, a pattern and example that he had been given. Uh, David wasn't just charging Solomon to do great things, but David was laying a foundation that Solomon could then stand upon. Uh, David had gotten it of the Spirit. Uh, he had received it not just in an imagination. It wasn't a pepperoni pizza dream one night. Uh, it wasn't just amusing while he sat there on his throne. Uh, but David had a relationship and a walk with God. Uh, and so when the day came and the moment came, uh, the Spirit began to plant down inside of the Father uh, the things that he was to teach his son. Uh, Dad, teach your babies how to throw a ball. Uh, teach them how to ride a bike. Teach them how to shoot a gun uh, while we still have that freedom. Uh, teach them how to balance a checkbook to change a tire or how to drive. Uh, but above all else, Dad, uh, you better be prepared to show them uh, the pattern of what you've received in the Spirit. Uh, you better be prepared to begin to teach them uh, this is what God uh, began to plant down in my heart. Uh, this is what God showed me, son. Uh, I want to teach you what what I've received from him. And David said to Solomon, his son, be strong and be of good courage and do it. Fear not, neither be dismayed, for the Lord God, even my God, uh, not just my God, but he'll be with you, uh, and he will not fail you nor forsake you until you finish this work for the service of the house of God. David realized in this moment in his son's life, a deep moment, one of the most pivotal moments that, that Solomon was going to ever live through, that his voice had power. Dad, uh, your voice has great power in the minds and in the hearts of your children. You have the authority to begin to speak life or begin to speak death into their world. Uh, so use that voice to build and not berate. Use your voice to comfort and not pro provide condemnation. Use uh, that voice to begin to lift up to your kids. Lift up your kids and encourage them. Why? Because they're hanging on your every word. They're listening to what dad says. Uh, and while you still have influence and while your voice still carries weight, use that voice to begin to build up uh, and to strengthen. Let your kids hear the sound of I love you come across your lips. Uh, let your kids hear the sound of praise coming out of your mouth. Let your kids hear the sound of you can do this. I believe in you come out of your mouth. But I speak to the one in here today who needs to hear from your father. Your earthly father perhaps was not perfect. Perhaps the last conversation or the most recent conversation you've had with your father, there was no encouragement coming. There was no peace. There was no joy. It was, it was tenuous. It was awkward. Or, or maybe you've not heard from dad, or dad has not been a good influence on your life. Hear me right now in the Holy Ghost. Your heavenly father uh, is crazy about his kids. He loves you uh, with an undying love. Uh, he loves you so deeply. You are not alone. Uh, you are not by your yourself. Uh, you've got a heavenly father uh, who wants to draw you to his side. Uh, he wants to begin to minister to you. He wants uh, the promises of his word uh, to begin to speak life down into your heart. David goes on and says in 1 Chronicles chapter 29 and verse 1, Solomon, my son, whom alone God hath chosen. He's young, he's tender, and the work is great. The palace isn't just for a man, it's for the Lord God. Now I have prepared with all my might for the house of my God the gold 
the silver, the brass, iron, wood, onyx, and stones, glistering stones, and diverse colors, and all manner of precious stones, and marble, and great abundance. And moreover, because I have set my affection to the house of God, of my own proper good, of gold and silver I've given to the house of God, and over above that that I've prepared, 3,000 talents of gold and 7,000 talents of refined silver, the gold for things of gold, the silver for things of silver, and for all manner of work to be made by the hands of the artificers. And who then is willing to consecrate his service this day unto the Lord? David had a grasp of something important that I'm trying to relate to us today. Generations do not occur in isolation. I am blessed by godly parents. They taught me, they believed in me, they pushed me, and I cannot squander that. I, I'm thankful that they still have influence in my life today. I'm able to stand here today in large part because uh, of the foundation of John chemists, uh, but I've got spiritual fathers in my life too, uh, and I'm able to stand here in large part because of Mark Brown, uh, or because of Mike Miller, uh, or Mike Woods, men uh, that took time uh, out of their schedule, time uh, out of their life to invest it into a little snot-nosed punk, uh, a young man that thought he knew everything but really knew nothing, uh, and begin to pour into them. I stand here today uh, building on the foundation foundations of my fathers but I've got kids in this room today as well and while I'm building on the foundation that my father gave to me, my eyes are not just on the past, but my eyes and indeed my heart uh, are looking to the future. Uh, I am determined to build a life. I'm determined to build a home and to build a family that my three kids uh, are going to be able to base off of. Uh, I'm determined not just to leave them uh, with what I had, uh, but to provide a foundation that's even greater so that the next generation can come and begin to take a step up on what was given to them and they can go another notch higher. I want my son to be a better preacher than I ever was. I want my daughter to be a better singer than I ever was. I want them to have greater access to God than I ever did. I want whoever comes after me and who steps into my footsteps to be able to build upon the foundation that I've laid for them. See, I'm determined to do as David did. I'm going to prepare with all my might. I'm setting my affection on the house of my God. Now, even if you're a first-generation apostolic here today or your father, your father wasn't serving the Lord, you've got apostolic forefathers who laid a foundation that you can build on. May we never forget the price that has been paid for this truth. May we never forget that people have died for the privilege of assembling together with believers. People have died because they desired to possess the Word of God. My forefathers paid with their lives to pass on the truth of Acts 2.38 and of the mighty God in Christ. That's the foundation that you and I build on. But Solomon, Solomon made some different decisions. The Bible reads in 1 Kings chapter 11 and verse 4, it came to pass when Solomon was old, that his wives turned away his heart after other gods. Isn't it a good thing it's not Mother's Day? And his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God, as was the heart of David, his father. Isn't it amazing? One generation removed, and they've already turned their hearts away. See, really, 
If you're in here today and you're beating yourself up because maybe your father wasn't in church or maybe you don't know your father, you're really no, no worse off than anybody else. Because the truth is never more than one generation away from being lost. And a walk with God is incumbent upon each and every one of us to, yes, I'm thankful for a foundation of my Father, but I can't live forever on the consecration of my Father. I can't walk forever. I can't minister based on what Dad did. Somewhere along the line, I've got to get a hold of it myself. And the Lord said to Solomon, as much as this is done of thee, as you've not kept my covenant and my statutes which I've commanded, I'll tear the kingdom, I'm going to rend the kingdom from you, and I'll give it to your servant. Notwithstanding in thy days, I won't do it for David thy father's sake, but I will rend it out of the hand of thy son. I won't tear away all the kingdom, but I'll give one tribe to thy son for David my servant's sake and for Jerusalem's sake, which I have chosen. See, I'm determined in this place today. Uh, maybe nobody else coming with me, but I'm going to be David and not Solomon. He was the wisest and the richest, sure. He was the most wealthy man and the wisest man that ever lived. Uh, but I'll go ahead and take humility and a walk with God over wealth and wisdom uh, if I can stay with him at the end. Uh, oh, just walk with him like David did uh, because there's no telling what kind of covering, Dad, uh, you're going to provide for your family. Uh, there's no kind of or no telling what kind of grace uh, is going to be produced for the next generation generation. Uh, time after time, the Bible mentions uh, the sure mercies of David. Uh, oh, because David walked with God, uh, the mercy of God was there for the next generation. Uh, and the mercy of God was there for the generation after that. Uh, and so, Dad, I challenge you today, uh, stand up on your feet. Uh, put your head uh, high. Uh, lift your hands to your God uh, and square your feet on his word uh, because there's no telling the impact you're having uh, on the next generation. Uh, there's no telling uh, the voice that you are having in the next generation. What shall I more say? Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 32. You see, we have fathers that have gone before us. For the Time would fail me to tell of Gideon and of Barak and of Samson and Jephthah, of David also and Samuel and of the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms. They wrought righteousness. They obtained promises. They stopped the mouths of lions. They quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, and out of weakness were made strong. They waxed valiant in fight. See, my dad could beat up your dad. They turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead raised to life again and others were tortured not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection and others. Uh, I'm talking about your fathers today uh, in this place. You see we have the right to assemble all because somebody loved the word of God enough uh, to give everything for it. That's the foundation that we get to build upon. Uh, others uh, others were tortured and they had trials of cruel mockings and scourging bonds and imprisonment they were stoned uh, they were sawn asunder they were tempted they were slain with the sword uh, they wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins being destitute afflicted tormented of whom this world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and in caves of the earth and these all having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. God's provided something better for us. That without us, they should not be made perfect. Wherefore, seeing we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set 
before us. You see, I'm thankful for the foundation I received uh, from Elder Chemist, uh, and I'm going to build on that foundation for my kids. Uh, but long before he ever came on the scene, uh, there was somebody named Peter, and somebody named Paul, and Andrew, and John, uh, and on and on and on throughout the centuries and generations. Uh, they've paid with their lives. Uh, they've laid them down. Uh, they've remained faithful. Uh, people whose names we won't not ever even know. Uh, they were faithful to the word of God. Uh, and here we sit in 2022 uh, without fear of the government coming in, uh, without fear of torture, uh, without fear of anybody coming in uh, and messing up a church service. Uh, and so I'm going to purpose in my heart, no, uh, I'm going to build a foundation for the next generation. Uh, I'm going to build something uh, for my precious babies to stand on. Uh, I'm going to put my feet down uh, in this generation. Uh, I'm going to be unashamed uh, and unafraid of the gospel. Uh, I'm going to be unapologetic uh, about the truth of God's word. Uh, I'm not going to look to the left. Uh, I'm not going to look to the right, but I'm going to build a foundation. Let's lift our hands in this place today. Uh, I love you, my Lord. Uh, I love you, my Lord. I love you, my Lord. Uh, See, we've got a promise from Haggai, chapter 2. God tells us the glory of the latter house will be greater than of the former. And it's easy for us to look back in Scripture, and it's easy for you in this place today, Dad, to say, well, how in the world am I supposed to compare with Peter and Paul? How, how in the world am I supposed to? You're not. Don't compare yourself to them. Just be you. Be you. God placed you here at this time because your heavenly father believes in you. And you can do it. You can be that example that your child needs. Oh, they'll have examples from Scripture. They'll have the examples of, of, of men throughout the Word of God. They'll have examples of great men of faith. But what they've got in their life is you. And if the Lord tarries, it's your example that they're going to build on. It's your life that they're going to begin to place brick after brick on top of. You see, if the Lord tarries, it's my kids that are going to carry out the Great Commission. It's my kids that are going to take it even further. And I'm going to hand it off to them with another layer on the foundation. Let's all stand together in this place. We're going to have two different prayers in this place today. This is probably not how we're always going to do it on Father's Day, but I do feel directed to do, do so today. If I could have every father in this house, every father in this place, could you join me across the front of this church today?